Okay, Zach, I think I did it. I think we are live on Facebook. Hi, everybody, wherever you are, I have been, I cannot tell you how stressed. Nothing was working the way it was supposed to, but now I am a technological wizard because I managed to pull this off. You really are. Yeah, you've been mocking me for three days. Um, so, for our pre-Mother's Day event, and I know Mother's Day is a loaded day for a lot of you. We'll talk about that in a little bit. I want to introduce Mr. Bill and my youngest son. Uh, Zach has, um, oh, Zach, you don't know this, but I uh, emailed both your brother and your bonus brother last week, and I told them that um, I'm giving you all my attention now instead of them, and they need to make an appointment with their therapist if this is giving them any trouble. I'm the youngest child. We unfortunately require the most attention. So my apologies okay. to them, my apologies to you. Oh, you don't, you're, you're happy about it. Don't give me this apology stuff. You're so <laughs> happy about it. Attention so, hog. Yeah, Zach was born in central New Jersey and um, grew up both in central New Jersey and the western suburbs of Chicago and went to college there at uh, Loyola University Chicago. He is the family's only Phi Beta Kappa, but that does not mean you're the smartest person in the family. <laughs> now I got where I got with with cunning and um, a little a little just a little bit of um, um, yes. cunning. <laughs> Oh, uh, anyway, so um, you stayed in Chicago for quite a while, started your career there, and then decided you would break your parents' heart by moving all the way across the country to the San Diego area. But we foiled you because we ended up buying a place out here so we can spend time with you. So I, you I could not know. ditch you and dad. I tried. Sorry. You know, it, we, uh, we, yeah, I, yes. You tried, but it didn't work. So that is kind of my digest of who you are. Why don't you tell us who you are? Because you do a lot of things in your life. Well, thank you for that, Mom. Thank you for having me on your Facebook Live. Um, I'm Zach Phillips. I am the son of Her Holiness, Ms. Susan Phillips, queen of uh, romantic comedy and Facebook. I, um, my reason for being really, I serve the music products industry, the music products and sound industry. I work for an association that um, really serves anybody who manufactures, makes, sells, retails musical instruments or sound gear. That's what I do. I run education for that association, actually, the education team. Um, and then when I have time, I'm, you know, hack songwriter. I do a little writing myself and spend a little too much time when I'm not reading, watching Netflix shows, so. You do, boy. Anything that's on Netflix, I can ask you about. Um, okay, this is a very fraught interview for me because I wanna have fun, but I wanna also resist all my temptations to throw you under the bus. So how am I doing so far? I'm going to move to San Diego in Southern California. So you, you reserve the right to throw me under the bus. So. Yeah. Okay. You, you all heard that. that, right? You all heard that. Um, I want to tell you, a, oh, first, I want Anything to tell you. the youngest child, mom, I'm unembarrassable. So go yeah, for that, it. That is pretty true. And me too. <clears throat> so I have to tell you a story about Dance Away With Me first. I want to talk about Zach's stuff, but first I want to talk about this. So I conceived Dance Away With Me as the story of this very um, a, a, sort of a tragic midwife lost, who's lost her husband. And um, I mean, a young, she's a young widow and she's come to salvation to, uh, oh, I got Salvation North Carolina on my brain. No, this is Tempest, Tennessee to just isolate herself. This is not gonna last long because she's gonna meet this enigmatic artist. So I started working on this book and I was probably maybe nine or 10 chapters into it and I could not figure out what kind of artist this guy was. So I take this to Zach and I say, Zach, I, I, you know, I got this. I just, what kind of an artist is he? And Zach, what did you say? I said, uh, you know, street artists are hip. Make him a street artist, you know, some sort of a, 
Yeah. It's funny enough because the Banksy movie was going around at the time, the Banksy documentary, which I still haven't seen. You've seen. Oh, so thought it, about is, that. it is so good. His work is so amazing. Did you see the, uh, have you seen the thing that he just put up where he's got the basket with um, like the nurses and the doctors as superheroes? Have you seen this one yet? No, that's, that's a great, great concept. I can picture it right now as you're saying it. Yeah. I'm he's feeling made, my visual of it's going to be what, what it actually is. It's a great concept. It was actually, your quote was, when I said, what kind of artist? You said, only one kind. He's got to be a street artist. And then you told me. And it was like, once you said that, that just clicked <laughs> in my brain. So thank you. And I didn't even dedicate Man, that. Man, the, the me of two years ago, when we had that conversation, is much smarter than the me of today. That 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 works. Kind yeah, of a renegade artist, you know, know. romantic comedy. I like it. And it was also so much fun to re to research street art because I all my idea of street art was graffiti, and yeah. you discovered this is because I love the art world anyway. This is just a whole new world. Yeah, and I really love that. So <clears throat> we might as well start off by arguing. Yes, so, when, uh, all of you out there, wait till you hear this. Just prepare yourself. You might need wine afterward. So <laughs> Zach, tell us what some of your favorite favorite books are. <laughs> your books oh you are such a liar such a liar go ahead i do like your books a lot um i've you know i i i i hesitate i hesitate to ever say i have broad taste because i feel like when people say they like everything it usually means it's kind of shallow and they don't really love anything but i do have very broad taste in in books and in music i would say my favorite just like the last 10 years, um, I love what David Mitchell does. Um, I thought the Bone Clocks was a masterpiece. You turned me on to, I know. No, you liked the Bone Clocks, I thought. You, you sort I, of liked it. I read it. I didn't hate it. Okay. I, yeah, I, I, oh, I just, that book, I that book. It was yeah. so inspiring for me. Um, you turned me on to Nathan Hill, The Knicks. So oh, you know, yeah. I, I, it's, I like all kinds of books, but my, my kind of pet favorite um, is with novels, with fiction, is literary fiction with a bit of a offbeat or even surrealistic edge to it. Um, Jonathan Franzen, Purity, we both like T.C. Boyle, Laurie Moore. Um, just read Disappearing Earth by Julia Phillips, you know, back in the fall, that was really interesting. Um, so that's sort of the through line with a lot of the, the books that, but you know, you turned me on to um, Tara Westover's book. The, the things being done with memoir right now by young people are amazing, so. Yeah. I turned you on to Trevor Noah's book too, Born to Cry. Oh, this is great. What a read. Yeah. A Isn't read. that something that, that parents and kids and grandparents should all be reading? Absolutely. And it's a different, you know, I mentioned, I joke that I'm obsessed with Netflix shows and Amazon Prime shows, but um, reading is a different, you just get something much different out of it. A friend of mine who doesn't like to read that much, although he does, he just doesn't get to as much as he wants. He always says, you know, I have trouble reading, but I'm always I'm always glad that I've read, and I yeah. feel that way. I mean, I love reading, um, but it's just such a different. Um, it's a long distance run. It's it's yeah. much more of a journey. It's a, it's a wonderful medium. The only well, there are two books that you recommended that I actually liked, did not hate, because yeah. I, I mean, I just can't. I I want. You don't need sympathetic characters to enter a book. No, I, I like I prefer unsympathetic characters actually because. What? It's very because it's cathartic for me. I learned something more about myself. I am um, I don't maybe I'm a bad person, mom. Maybe you didn't raise me right. But I am um, I get a lot more out of them, assuming they're not evil. Um I like characters that are flawed. I, I have so much trouble with that. But the two books I'm a rock musician. We're bad boys by nature, mom. <laughs> so the two books you turned me on to recently that I really, really liked, Daisy Jones and the Six. Did not think I was going to like that because I didn't want to read another book about drugged out rockers. Good but read. Good read. Fascinating. That book was fascinating because of the narrative, the way every character was telling things differently. Can, can I can I can I interject to something about that book that I thought was interesting, Mom? As somebody who reads a lot of rock journalism, who who lives and breathes music, apparently the author I, I read about her. She I don't think she's a musician, um, but the lyrics she wrote for that book, the kind of, you know, for the, the make-believe songs were really good. And she wrote about music with such detail, nuance, and authority, I was convinced she'd done some rock criticism. Yeah. Or it was a musician and she wasn't. So just very skillful. 
Yeah, it yeah. Fun. yeah. It was a fun read. It was quick. Yeah, I, I like that book too. I, I thought it was a little slow getting going. And some people, some readers uh, here, some of my friends here have told me they thought it was a little slow. But I also heard that um, they loved the audio of it, which yeah. I think would have been a cool listen. Yeah. So um, the next thing I want to tell, I want to ask, oh, and the other book I loved really shockingly was that T.C. Boyle book. Um, what's the name of it? Drop, Drop City. Drop City. Yeah. What a weird book. Very good. I like offbeat fiction. If it's not offbeat, I'm not that interested. I like something that that's familiar enough, but offbeat enough. That was that was a really interesting book, wasn't it? Well, yeah. And what I loved about it is it really pulled you in. You've got this wacky survival story. Yeah. And you've got. OK, my sister, if you were watching this, please stop sending me messages <laughs> she's texting me i forgot to turn my text off <laughs> i love you <laughs> um what i really enjoyed is the background of the 70s hippies living on that commune that was yeah. fascinating and then putting them in the alaskan wilderness how crazy is that it was it was crazy <laughs> it, it, hey, i this is completely off, well not completely off topic but i don't know if you checked your email i sent you a link this morning uh, because i love to send my kids links to various emails um it that was interesting i've not got by the way and, and i'll get credit words to mom this is mother's day so we have to celebrate our friendship um you you are the queen of sending mom links but they're all pretty interesting like that one i'm looking at like ooh, was, i think it was from the guardian i've got to get to that one we have more yes so I'm not prepping for your, your Facebook Live. <laughs> I'll try to put post the link on my Facebook page in the next couple of days. The Guardian has a story. You all remember uh, Lord of the Flies, the William, William Golding. I, I get Goldman and Golding book um, where all of the children are nasty and they devour each other and whatever. Anyway, there's a real story of what happened when these uh, young boys were marooned for 15 months on an island. And... Uh, it was not it was not anything like Golding predicted. The kids worked together. It's fascinating anyway. I'll, I'll link it up. Um, so here's what I'm thinking, Zach. You have a new album out, which I think is really, really cool, called The Wine of Youth. Um, there's been a gap between the last time you did an album and this time. I think this is, I, I love that last album, but I think this is a really, a very mature kind of sophisticated work. How would you describe oh, yeah. this? How would you I'll, describe I'll stick with mature and sophisticated. I like that. <laughs> um, well, what I would say is my primary musical style, musicians hate defining their style. I don't mind because I feel like even within a genre, there's so many sub genres. I'd say it's, it's pretty straight folk, actually kind of like the fiction I like. It's, it's straight folk rock, but there's a slightly offbeat, um, so there's some jagged edges to it. You know, the songs are very simple, but the, the production, um, I produced, worked on it with a great producer, Greg Montanti, and we made a conscious decision to make it a little bit more jagged and off the beaten path than your standard folk rock or roots rock or indie country album. Yeah, there's almost a little bit of an experimental chamber pop edge to it too. I just give you like five styles, but if people hear it, they'll say, okay, I get it now. But yeah, it, it's, it's an interesting idea. But what, what was the inspiration behind the album? I know this and I think this is fascinating, but I want to share it with my friends here. Oh, I hope I get this right. If I don't, if I don't get it right. Um, uh oh, if you don't get know. it right, I'll correct you. Okay. Um, well, I hadn't recorded anything in a long time. And my wife put out a, a great album called Go for the Moon. Her name's Gloria Taylor. Check it out, shameless plug. And she went- Wait a minute, really by the way, I'm, I'm gonna have Gloria on sometime in the next few weeks because I think it'll just be really fun to do this with her too, but go oh, ahead. She, she, that'll be a fun interview. She, she'll be great. Um, well, she worked with this producer, Greg Montanti, who's really talented. And I saw how much fun they were having. I thought, you know, I'm just gonna try to write some songs again. So I started writing songs and Mom, you know this, and every author out there watching this knows this, and every songwriter knows this. Um, usually, you don't always perceive consciously what's influencing your work or what what sort of the um, what some of the themes are that are influencing your work while you're writing it. But when I stepped away from this and I looked at the collection of songs I'd written for this album, it was really an album about there are a couple a couple key themes and through lines. It was an album about aging. Um, not good or bad, right, wrong, or indifferent, just observing it. It was an album about um, 
um, nature, but not nature like hiking up in a mountain. It was, it was about nature and the universal cycles of life. And at the risk of sounding kind of bold, you know, in the afternoon, sort of the universal cycles of the universe. Um, and it was also a California album. There's a rich tradition of, of folk rock and folk and, and rock in Southern California. And I wanted to celebrate something that wasn't the entertainment Los Angeles um, beaches part of California that gets so often celebrated. And there's a lot of great music with it. I mean, think of the Beach Boys and Jackson Brown, Neil Young and Joni Mitchell and the list goes on. Um, I wanted to do something that celebrated kind of what I've termed the old weird California, the mountains, the desert. I mean, you drive 45 minutes east of San Diego. And again, San Diego is very much Southern California. You drive 45 minutes east, you're in the mountains. You might find some little off the beaten path hiking trail that's very quiet. And, and, and again, talk about the style of the album and jagged in its beauty. Um, so those were kind of the, the, the essence of the album is that it, a lot about aging cycles, nature, um, forgiveness, and also California. It's a California album. It is. Did I say, how was that? How did I do? I think you did great and I want to hear a song. Okay, sure. That'd be fun. Um, now, like I said, a lot of, a lot of, um, I'm a big fan of like chamber pop. I mean, you listen to things like the Beach Boys and the Beatles and Big Star and the Zombies. So these, the arrangements on this album are much more elaborate than this. I'm doing a very, very stripped down, no harmonies, no drums, nothing. But this is the, um, second track on the album called Ladybird. Cycles just begun. Thought that this would be the end. The holy wind whispers, catch a fall and magpie, and sing to the rhythm until we cry. Sing to the rhythm until we cry, and there's nothing to forgive. Catch a thieving butterfly and sing to the rhythm until we die. Sing to the rhythm until we die and lonely spirits live. Ladybird, would you come around again? It's more than maternal pride that makes me like your music. Mm -hmm. I've been playing your, um, I've been playing your CD in the morning when I do my yoga stretching. You know, you told me something. Uh, by the way, my friends, most of my friends here know that I'm the only non-musical person in the entire family, including grandchildren, including our bonuses. Every single person is musical except me. You told me, and you I don't did get me into Bruce Springsteen though as oh, a child. That, you indoctrinated well, me. That was a good, good religion to be theory. indoctrinated into. 
It had to happen, grew up in New Jersey. But you were talking about how um, when you did this album, you you got rid of all the spaces between songs. So it just flowed from one thing to another. And when you were telling me this, I was kind of hearing ba 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 But then when I was, when I had been stretching and doing things like that, I love the way it kind of flows from one thing to another. Is there like, why do musicians do that? Why do they not do it? What's, what's the, I don't get it. All I know is I liked it. Well, that's a good question. Um, I think that you know, we're in the age of Spotify and streaming now. So we're in a very song oriented world, which is good. And there's a lot of great songs coming out. Um, as a early middle-aged man, I'll, I'll stress the early, you know, um, I still love albums. I find the album to be a perfect format, you know, 40, 40 to 40, 50 minutes of, of music, a well-constructed album to me is just a great work of art. It's inspiring. It's the right amount of time. And I especially love an album that feels like a cohesive whole um, where you could remove the, the parts from the whole, the songs, if you will, um, but they really coalesce to form something greater than, than their parts. The sum is greater than, than the parts. And with this album, I wanted to recreate the feel of an album. I mean, it's, it's to some extent thematically a concept album or a song cycle. Um, but maybe a little more tenuously than an album like Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band by the Beatles, for instance. So one of the ways I, I wanted to recreate that even artificially was shrinking the space between songs so people saw that it was part of one song cycle, one little kind of mini pocket symphony, if you will. Um, you know, it was a cheap and easy trick to do it, but it also sat to me, sometimes that doesn't work to me, it just sounded good. So if people are listening to it, by the way, picture at the end of the eighth track, uh, Stranded in the Night, seventh track rather, Stranded in the Night, that's where you'd flip the record and go to side B, which would start with Cemetery Girl. Um, that was all deliberate because I wanted there to, I, I felt there was flow in, in eliminating spaces and in, in, in um, programming the, the songs the way they were in that order. There's such a correlation to that with writing. Absolutely. Yeah, in terms of moving from one scene to another, in, in terms of the rhythm of a scene. Um, when I'm writing, I try to end every chapter on something that makes the reader turn the page mm -hmm. because I'm trying to, and maybe I shouldn't tell my readers this. Uh, you know how you say one more chapter and then I'll turn out the light and go to sleep? Yeah. I try to make that impossible. So it sounds like kind of the same thing. By the way, Zach, I, I hesitate to tell you this, and please don't start crying in front of everybody. But when you were singing... But you're not my mom? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no. When you were singing, there was a tiny, tiny little internet bleep where you went mute for a little bit. And I this drives my friends, this drives him crazy. Everything has to be perfect. And when he finds this out later, if he listens, he's going to have a total freak out. But we all know it was not that big a deal. It's Facebook Live. It's fast and loose. It's Mother's Day holiday weekend. I'll, li I'll live with it. <laughs> just say now. I'll live with it, I think. So I want to talk a little bit about early music memories. Uh, this is a story I've told before, and it's it, you might squirm a little bit, but you know what, deal with it. When you were really little from the time you were a couple weeks old, I would take you to the library just in a front pack. And you were in the library every week growing up. You were, when you were about three, you were obsessed, obsessed. Probably crawl off camera. No, See you guys. You stay right there. I'm you good. stay right there. So, oh, he's such a coward. So when you were about three, <laughs> watch him squirm this is so much fun we'd go into the library and you would make a beeline for the children's library the the table that had the big box of records on top and you would if I didn't get to you fast enough you would crawl up and you were in those records and it got to be when the librarians saw you coming in yeah. they, would, they would say hello Susan hello Zach and immediately go over and put the box of records up so you couldn't get I was it. sort of like public enemy number one at the library <laughs> at that point wasn't I I mean they, they would see me coming and just like they had to call in the, the cavalry is a wonder librarian still talk to you yeah so you, what are your I have early music memories of you but what are your er, early music memories you know when we talked beforehand you mentioned that you might you, you might want to discuss that and the funny thing is I, I, you know, our family's known for having decent memories, but I can't 
remember my earliest music memories. I remember just falling in love with the theme song to Star Wars, like anybody born in the 70s. Um, I remember getting a little older, call it between the ages of like four and six, uh, you know, dad putting on um, Eagles albums or Crosby, Stills and Nash albums. And I remember at the time even thinking, yeah, I don't really relate to this. I do now, but at the time I thought, man, those melodies are incredible. And what they're doing with harmony is incredible. Um, so that's my earliest musical memory. I, it's, it's, it's kind of unceremonious because there's, there's no one thing that I, I can lock into and say, yeah, that's when I fell in love with music, but it sounds like it was probably innate if I was, you know, was pillaging the library and, and, and tormenting these, these poor librarians. Sorry about that. Um, no, it was, it, from the very beginning, you're, you're, um, you know, you had little record players and things like that, like yeah. some children. Mickey did. Mouse record player. Everybody knows but, what I'm talking about who's born in that time frame. Mickey Mouse I record player. Going into your bedroom constantly, there were always records everywhere. Yeah. And you and your brother and your bonus brother, all three of you, from the time you were really little, um, were into music. Uh, but not being musical myself, I just thought all kids could play Jingle Bells on the Fisher Price xylophone. I did not realize realize there was a gift until until you started getting older. Well, there's so, a reason for that, Mom. It's because I don't even think I could play Jingle Bells on the xylophone. <laughs> <laughs> My brother probably could, but your brother could. <laughs> I'm a late bloomer. <laughs> yeah. And so when did you, I can't remember how you got started playing guitar? Was it with Dad or was it lessons or what? I was also trying to remember this um, because I remember when I started playing guitar, but I don't remember the precipitating event. I think it was seeing the video for Welcome to the Jungle and Sweet Child of Mine by Guns N' Roses enough on MTV at the time and just thinking, how is Slash doing that? It was probably 1988, maybe a year after that album came out. Um, and there was, there was also a guy who lived on our street who had a guitar um, and could play a few chords and had a nice amp. And I thought, you know, just, that is a, you know, this, this is a very uh, mythic instrument. I want to learn this. And the, that was I that. I banged around on dad's old Gibson hollow body. Right. Yeah. I cannot even come up. We spent how much money we spent on how many instruments and how many instruments we had in the house when you were growing up. We you used them all. We, we used them. We got mileage out of those things. Yeah. But I didn't, you know, a lot of musicians will say they grew up and there was always music in the house. That that wasn't true in our household because no. I didn't have radio on all the time and I wasn't playing music all the time. Now, my uh, brother, I mean, your, your oldest son was the glue. Um, I mean, dad is a great classical guitar player, but he wasn't playing it that much at the time. He was, wasn't. you know, neck deep in his career and, and didn't pick it up really until near his early retirement. But um right. Uh, yeah, your, your oldest son was the glue there. He was, he was the guy who was pushing it. He was our, our music so, pusher. So um, how about another song? We're kind of getting close to. to winding down here. I got a couple more questions for you. Okay. But I'd love to have another song first. My pleasure. It's, and um, thanks to all your readers who tuned into this. By the way, while, you, um, while you're getting ready, if any of you are curious about what's over my head, I did not pick out this light fixture. And first time I saw it, I thought it was ugly. I love it now. So I know it's a little weird looking, but that's what you're seeing is a light fixture, bedroom light fixture. That looks like it's something right out of the MoMA. I mean, that looks like a piece of modern it art, doesn't it? Yeah, it's very beachy. So mom, what's your theme again? Life's too short to read depressing books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm one of those weird musicians that the sadder the song, the more cathartic it is. So <laughs> I, this is like, you know, you, you, you become like your parents and you also become their opposites in some ways. Um, with that said, so I'll try this song. This is off The Wine of Youth, my, my new album. And thank you all, all to your readers for tuning in. This is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for the plug, Mom. Um, this is a song called Doesn't Feel Like California. Why must the rain retreat so soon? This land we love's a fiery tomb. Down and out in California today. Waiting for the earth to still. Maybe I can make it if I use my will. 
So it seems in California today. Summer never breaks out here. The earth it always shakes, I fear. The same tides that rise are the same tides that fall. California at all Why must the earth burn so blue this land we love's a holy tomb Down and out in the wayward desert today I can see a burning light It's far away but it's within my sight In the hills, the wayward desert today Summer never breaks out here The earth it always shakes I fear The same tides that rise are the same tides that fall Today doesn't feel like California at all celebration of this lovely state but we've seen some um some strange hardship you learn things living on the west coast it's different than living in the midwest you know but you're still there. a midwestern boy it, absolutely through and through but you know <laughs> i'm i'm still tornadoes versus wildfires i would have bet tornadoes wildfires are, are terrifying so yeah yeah, it's funny because, I mean, you do have your roots born on the East Coast, raised in the Midwest, and adult years on the West Coast. So it, it, that's kind of interesting. You know, because you're a professional in the music industry, I think it'd be really interesting, you know, you grew up with music lessons and all kinds of things going your way, to talk to parents out there and grandparents. What? How do you think the best way is to deal with approach kids in terms of music, especially kids who are really interested mm -hmm. in music, looking back and, and as an adult and as a kid? That's a good question, mom. That's a really good question. Um, there is no right way to do it. If somebody wants to get their kid involved in music, there's no right way to do it. The only thing I would stress though, is there's sort of a school of thought um, that sort of says, teach kid, you know, if a kid wants to play guitar, well, they have to start on the acoustic guitar, but they want the electric guitar, no acoustic guitar. Or if a kid wants to learn piano, well, they have to learn technique and proper pedagogy first. I think all of those things are incredibly important. Um, yes, there's a caveat. Um, I think those things are incredibly important. The caveat is <clears throat> a good music teacher nowadays with as much, with as many distractions as kids have, We'll get that kid up and playing music immediately. They can learn the technique, the pedagogy, the music theory uh, as they start to learn as they start to learn songs. Um, I have a, a, a friend of mine who's an incredible music teacher, and he always says, 
At the end of the first lesson, I'm getting that kid playing music. At the end of week four or five, I'm getting that kid performing because that will keep kids involved. I think if, if, if there's too much of a focus on, um, well, let's get them kind of ready for it. No, you got to get people playing. I had an incredible guitar teacher, Kevin Reed. Um, yeah. He and I still talk, you know, we're, we're, he's got a great Facebook and Instagram page. Um, and he got me playing and I'll always be grateful for that. And he taught me theory. And um, I just think music's so important. It's such a, 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 um, a, 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 a critical component of people's lives. And it does so many things for people mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, that what's important is that people start to play. Um, of course, you want people to not hurt themselves. You can mess up your hand if you start playing the wrong way. But I think a good teacher gets kids playing. And parents, if your kid wants to learn electric guitar, get them an electric guitar. Do not force them to play the, I mean, I love the acoustic guitar. I started electric guitar first. My mom had the foresight. There's just too many distractions with things like, I mean, I think video games are great. I love video games, but music does something else for people. And um, how do you, uh, so how does a parent- Here's my, I'm evangelizing. Sorry, mom. No, no, this is, I, I think this I'm is- passionate really about this. And the only way, the only reason you started an electric instead of acoustic was total ignorance on my part, had no idea. Or, you know, you were pretty stubborn. You might've insisted on it. I pulled the wool over your eyes. <laughs> but how do you find that teacher? What questions do you ask to find that teacher? Oh, that's a great question. I think the question the parent needs to ask or the student, if they um, know what they want, I, th I think they just need to say, this is what I want to learn. I want to learn how to play if, you know, if a younger person might say, I want to learn this Taylor Swift song. Okay, that's achievable. We're going to work toward that. Um, and, you know, by the end of the first lesson, it'd be great if they knew a couple chords or could start working on that. So again, it's not to, I, I think it'd be dangerous if we just turned our backs on important things like technique, pedagogy, music theory. Those are critical. I learned those and those inform everything um, related to what I do when I play music but get kids playing, get them performing because it's most um, friends and colleagues of mine in the music products industry who run great lesson programs or great music schools. The biggest issue aside from getting new students is losing students. Retention is a massive issue. And they're usually people lose students because the teacher doesn't get them playing or performing fast enough. It's like sitting down in front of a, it, it, I remember piano lessons were always tailored toward turning you into a classical pianist. Yeah, not good. No. Not good. I love classical, but I wish I, I could, you know, I mean, Beethoven's piano pieces are some of my favorite pieces. Moonlight Sonata is my favorite piece of instrumental music. I wish I could play it, but I think that there's too many distractions right now. And, and, and you know, we're just moving at hyper speed. You need to get a kid playing something so they want to stick with it. Yeah, I, I love that. I think that that's important advice. Hey, Zach, Tell everybody, because I had a hard time figuring out how to download this and oh, you know, so how do how do people who want to hear more of your fabulous album how do they find it? You, I, this, this is this is good mothering, mom. You're you're building up my self esteem. Thank you for that. Even in, in adulthood, um, thank you for that. It, so the distributor that I'm using, CD Baby, that a lot, a lot of people know them, um, because of COVID-19, they're not warehousing anything right now. So we're, we're gonna have to go a little old school. Um, right. Type in Zach Phillips, The Wine of Youth on Spotify. Type in Zach Phillips, The Wine of Youth on Apple Music, Google it. You'll find a digital service to listen to it. Um, if you want the CD, which I recommend just because it's, I think a better experience. Um, it's got some cool shots from our, our trips around Central and Southern California. Um, Right now, in the meantime, it will be up on, you know, you'll be able to buy it online, but you can't right now just because they're the warehousing situation. Go to my website, zachphillips.com. There's a form at the very bottom of my homepage. Write me and I'll send it to you old school. I think it costs between three to five dollars to mail a CD now. This is something I was shocked about because I had mailed a CD in a decade. Um, so I am asking for a ten dollar donation to cover costs via Oh, PayPal you should be asking for a lot more than that. No, 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 no. Music's, music's brilliant. You know, artists, I believe in artists being paid, but um, mm -hmm. just enough to cover recording and, and shipping costs. So 10 bucks, PayPal, Venmo me, um, email me. You know, you can find my contact form. There's a familiar figure sitting right down here in the corner. I think I recognize that. There's a little the story behind. It. So I, when, when, <laughs> when I started that, I wanted to, um, I wanted the album cover to be very, I love like psychedelic, surrealistic album covers. 
but I wanted to be a little have the kind of whimsy and playfulness of like an indie rock cover at the same time. So that's a photo I took of Gloria, my bride, in, in the blonde in that lower corner. Yeah, they're right there. And um, that was up at a backwater lake near Lake Tahoe, actually. It's not Lake Tahoe. That was a photo. Oh, I thought it was Lake Tahoe. What's no. that? I thought it was Lake Ta Tahoe. No, it's a tiny little lake. We hiked about three miles um, inland from South Lake Tahoe, Eagle Lake near Eagle Falls. It's a small little lake. It's beautiful. It's one of the most stunning sights I ever saw. That was just right at dusk. And I took the photo and I thought this would make a great cover to like Gloria's next album. She does like a, like a, like a folk album. Um, and then I held on to it and held on to it. And I thought, I'm, I'm going to hand this off. So I, I found a, um, a uh, artist in the UK who does like, like uh, collages. And she used that photo as the basis of it. Yeah, brilliant. That's really cool. Man. So when you are doing a CD yourself, you get to control your cover, which is a little bit different than um, when you are an author and you're working with editorial, you're working with sales, you're working with the art department. And so you never kind of know what you're gonna come up with because you also have to, when you're doing a cover, um, you have to make sure that the the that Barnes and Noble, that Target, that Walmart like your cover so that they take your book. Yeah. So um, I I kind of envy you getting to be able oh, to have complete. Make, make no mistake, Mom. I have literally bought CDs and and records based on their covers before. Oh. I hate to admit it. I no, you know, I know you do, and a lot of readers out there. We've talked about this, and a lot of you do the same thing. I know. And books too. I bought some books, so this is very indulgent. I don't know. It's the most commercial cover, but to me, it was the sound I was hearing in my. It was the what I was picturing in my head when I was listening to the music. So and you're allowed to do it. So Zach, it's we're coming to an end here, and um, before I'm going to ask you to sing us out, but before that, I just want to give a Mother's Day message. Mother's Day it can be a complicated. Um, holiday for a lot of people. Uh, some of you have had wonderful experiences mothering. Some of you have not had wonderful experiences mothering. Some of you have wanted to be mothers and not. There's a lot of stuff hanging off it. And I hope that um, this time with Zach and me has been just a time to just enjoy. A lot of you are going to be separated from your kids um, because of being in social um because of social distancing. And I hope that this ex socially distance experience that Zach and I are having is, uh, is enjoyable to all of you. I'd like to wish all of you a happy Mother's Day, no matter what form it takes. If it involves wine and tequila, go for it. And Zach, how about singing us out? Absolutely. What you just said, by the way, I can't see my stepdaughter, can't see my niece and nephew. It's rough. So I feel for it, all the mothers out there who are Bye, Mother's Day socially distanced. So um, this is an outtake. This actually didn't appear on the album. I thought it actually sounded a little too much sonically like the previous song I played, but I'll give everybody an exclusive. This is called, um, yeah, I think you, you actually liked the song when I, when I sent you the demo. So I'll play it. It's called Flowering Bell. For me, you're playing it for me. That's right. Mother's Day. Dark winds, California night, Santa Ana's blowing hard. I guess it's all right. People I know are going, people I know are going. off to the valley it's a desert made of light let's get old school while we have time people I love are leaving people I love are leaving Flowering bell, leave well enough alone. Flowering bell, don't let so much die if you grow.
light fades and time is moving fast guess I should be good cause tomorrow they'll come back people I love are leaving I love her leaving Flowering bell Leave well enough alone Flowering bell Don't let so much die As you grow Thanks all.